It was at Chateau Merville in northern France that Baron Pierre de Coubertin first dreamed of the rebirth of the world's greatest sporting spectacle. Inspired by the myths and legends of the Olympic Games of the ancient Greeks, Coubertin visited Olympia in 1894. Just two years later, he would return to Greece for the first games of the modern era. Coubertin devoted his life and family fortune to providing the spark that reignited the Olympic flame. According to legend, conflict amongst the gods was the origin of the Olympic Games. Zeus defeated his father, Kronos, king of the Titans, to become father of all gods and supreme deity. He decreed that athletic contests be held in the sacred groves at Olympia to glorify his triumph. With an estimated global audience of four billion, the Olympic Games are a sporting festival matched by no other. Just as in ancient times, the modern Olympic Games create heroes who are hailed as sporting deities.
The drama and excitement of the ancient games enriched Greek life for over a thousand years from 776 BC. This athletic tradition was so central to Greek culture that its calendar counted time in Olympiads, the four-year cycle of the games. Eventually, with the Christian Roman Empire ascendant, the Olympic Games were abolished as a pagan ritual. The Olympic tradition was lost to the world. Interest was rekindled after the liberation of Greece from Ottoman rule in 1821. Curiosity intensified after 19th century German excavations revealed the original site of the games at Olympia. The Greeks began to organize modern Pan-Hellenic games in the Olympic tradition. Gymnastic festivals also appeared in Scandinavia, Germany and Central Europe while William Penny Brooks began his own Olympian Games in England. But it wasn't until the International Olympic Committee was formed in Paris in June 1894, at the prompting of Coubertin, that the Olympic Games were finally reborn. Greek enthusiasm ensured the first modern games were organized in less than two years. In April 1896, the youth of the world gathered to celebrate the games. However, that youth numbered just 241 competitors, all of them men from only 14 countries. The games, though, had returned. The Paris Games in 1900 were a shambles, notable only for the inclusion of female athletes. St. Louis, Missouri, four years later, were better organized, but little more than a sideshow to the World Fair. The London Games in 1908 were a major breakthrough. Despite bitter American complaints about British bias in the judging, the Games ran smoothly and caught the public's imagination. Stockholm in 1912 brought further progress. Electronic timing and a public address system were introduced. It was eight years before the Games were celebrated again, in Antwerp in 1920. Olympic truces may have halted conflicts in the ancient world, but nothing could resist the destructive force of World War I. But the Olympic spirit was strong enough to survive. Finland's Paavo Nurmi won three gold medals. Fourteen-year-old Aileen Riggin won gold in the women's diving. The watching world took the diminutive American to their hearts. Despite her starring role at the Games, her most lasting memory was of the ravages of war. It was devastating. There was nothing there. Towns like Ypres, which had been fully restored, and were non-existent. They're just piles of rubble. And we were allowed to pick up anything we wanted to do. <laughs> but there was nothing, nothing to see. But it was an adventure. And the children came out to see us. We were Americanos, so we were popular. 
because of after the war. And uh, they all came out and gathered around, had their pictures taken around the Jeep that we were in. Paris in 1924 was a triumph. The games are now associated with the film Chariots of Fire, which immortalized the exploits of Britain's Harold Abrahams and Eric Little. In 1924 also saw the first Olympic Winter Games at Chamonix in France. They were attended by nearly 300 competitors from 16 countries. The Summer Games were now firmly established. The Amsterdam Games in 1928 featured over 3,000 competitors from 46 countries. By the time the Games went to Los Angeles in 1932, the Olympic Festival had secured its place in 20th century folklore. The 20th century, however, began to exert its own influence on the Games. Technology made a significant impact. Eddie Toland's controversial victory in the 100 meters was decided by the first ever use of photo finish cameras. World-famous athletes such as swimmer Johnny Weissmuller became Hollywood stars. Suddenly, Olympic success could mean more than just the glory of victory. Inevitably, the modern Olympic movement had to face harsh truths as its prestige and profile grew. After just over a century of modern Olympic history, it's not just the deeds of the Olympic champions that are striking. The remarkable idealism which surrounds the Games lies at the heart of their appeal. Coubertin's concept of Olympism has come to epitomize all that is best in sporting values. The celebration of the Games has become an occasion of global fascination. Games have witnessed courage in the pursuit of excellence and inspirational feats of personal and national pride. There has been dramatic change, progress in the appearance of new sports and new techniques, and the emergence of a greatly extended family of athletes. But greed and the ugly desire to win at any price have darkened Olympic history. Political manipulation and violence have also stained the games. The games of the modern era are still youthful in comparison with their ancient predecessors. Even so, they have already created many remarkable chapters in their history. Pythagoras of Rhodes, the legendary boxer of the ancient games, was revered for his courage and sense of honor. Legend has it that many years after his own triumphs, whilst watching the victories of his sons, he was brought before the spectators at Olympia. The crowd adored him. They called to him to abandon his mortal life and sit with the gods on Mount Olympus. Upon hearing this, he bowed his head and died for he was the noblest athlete of all.
Alberto Juantarena, Cuba, double Olympic champion, 400 and 800 meters, Montreal, 1976. There is no other sports event in the world that generates so much joy and happiness. The Olympics are truly exceptional. Sebastian Coe, Great Britain, twice Olympic champion, 1980 and 84, 1500 meters. Ever since I started running and was old enough to have a perception about what the sport was about, the Olympic Games was the only thing you ever wanted. Sergei Bubka, Ukraine, pole vault champion, 1988. <laughs> It's impossible to compare it to anything else. I took part in many competitions and won a lot of titles. The World Championships are great, but it doesn't compare. The most precious thing in my trophy collection is my Olympic medal from Seoul. The ideals at the heart of the Olympic Games are the ethical foundations of sport. Fair and equal competition, the pursuit of excellence, participation, fair play and internationalism. The Olympic movement's founding father's belief in fair and equal competition was rooted in the amateur code of events like the Henley Royal Regatta in Britain. Such amateurism was built on the class distinction between gentlemen, who competed for pleasure, and tradesmen, who competed for money. Professionals were thought to take sport too seriously and thus to have an unfair advantage. They were barred from Olympic competition. The amateur code was embraced as the Olympic code and initially was strictly enforced. At the Stockholm Games in 1912, America's Jim Thorpe astounded the world in winning gold in both the pentathlon and the decathlon. The King of Sweden called him the greatest athlete in the world. But it was discovered that he'd earlier played minor league baseball for money. Thorpe was stripped of his medals. He was only reinstated as a champion long after his death. Maintaining amateur status caused many athletes problems. Some just relied upon not getting caught. Czech discus thrower Olga Fikatova and American hammer thrower Harold Connolly, both gold medalists, fell in love in Melbourne in 1956. Their romance succeeded in lifting the Iron Curtain. But their tale of love in a Cold War climate didn't pay the bills. We got rescued by cheating on our amateur status because we were really penniless. We had all this publicity, but we didn't know where to turn when Ed Sullivan, the great Ed Sullivan, after our being on his show, he gave us $2,000 and he said, any, anybody who thinks must know that you guys have no money. Here's a gift for you. You take it and run. The amateur code was becoming increasingly difficult to enforce. Austria's Karl okay. Schratz is one of skiing's greats. A silver medalist in the giant slalom at Innsbruck in 1964, he was a strong favorite for all three Alpine disciplines at the 72 Winter Games at Sapporo.
But as the Olympic flame lit the way to northern Japan, Schranz's commercial endorsements came under scrutiny. I never believed I would be disqualified. I thought that the Olympic Committee and the Olympic movement would be strong enough to face reality. That it wouldn't matter if one skier earned more or less than another. If you were going to question one, you really needed to question skiing as a whole. Schrantz didn't march with his teammates at the opening ceremony. His income from endorsements had branded him as a professional. The comments of IOC President Avery Brundage infuriated the Austrians. Incidentally, the International Olympic Committee does not disqualify competitors. They disqualify themselves by violating the rules. In Japan, Switzerland's Bernhard Rusi won the downhill gold. Yet, ironically, Rusi had also earned endorsement money. The amateur rules had become outmoded. They have been gradually abandoned in favor of open access to events, regardless of professional or amateur status. I'm especially glad that my belief that the best athletes should compete came true and uh, that today everybody can take part. The Olympic ideal of pure competition is courageous pursuit of excellence. American Greco-Roman wrestler Jeff Blatnik reached the super heavyweight final at Los Angeles in 1984. But for Blatnik, even being there was remarkable. Under international rules, he's behind him again, he scores, not yet, not yet, he's got to get his knee down to the mat, there it is, another point takedown, Jeff Blatnik of the United States ahead 2-0. to zero. I went into the games with the thought of a warrior, with the thought of being a wrestler, and None of the distractions on the side. Uh, no one picked me to win a medal. Uh, I was relatively unknown to the national media. Blatnik had been diagnosed with cancer two years before. He had had radiation therapy and his spleen was removed. ago two years ago you had cancer you now care gold medal it must feel great I'm happy dude <laughs> well the crowd is happy with you too Jeff the crowd's happy with you too great job well, Jeff I'm sorry I can't talk that's all right everyone's a champion that comes into this field and in this arena uh, I, I believe at that point everybody becomes equal it's not necessarily a matter of skill it's a matter of will as well. And if someone that is determined they can't lose can overcome someone that thinks that they can win. American Greg Luganis had to muster the resolve of a 